Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOC course on Economics of Health and Education. Dear learners, in the last two uh, lessons of this week, we studied about the unique aspects of healthcare uh, markets. We also distinguished healthcare markets vis-a-vis uh, -vis perfectly competitive markets in economics and we understood uh, some of the uh, key characteristics of uh, health and healthcare uh, markets. Uh, now, when we are discussing markets, we refer to exchange of goods and services in the markets. But as we have seen that health and healthcare markets have unique uh, characteristics, uh, we now need to see whether uh, the similar kinds of theorizations that are applicable to physical goods and services in economics can also be applied in the context of health and education markets. Now, in this uh, context, uh, in 1972, an economist named uh, Michael Grossman uh, did some groundbreaking work uh, which was published in his monograph, Demand for Health, Theoretical and Empirical Investigation, in which he introduced uh, certain concepts surrounding health, uh, which became the benchmark for discussing demand for health. We will get introduced to the Grossman's model of demand for health in this uh, lesson. But in the interest of uh, learners who are from non-economics background, I have uh, divided uh, today's uh, lesson into two parts. In the first part, we will uh, look uh, at, we will have an overview of basic microeconomics concepts. Uh, we will get introduced to, uh, in very simple terms, what is the meaning of demand function, uh, what are the implications of uh, having a downward sloping demand curve, uh, substitution effect, income effect, elasticity of demand and also indifference curves, budget line and utility maximization. Now, uh, an introduction to the microeconomics of consumer choice theory is a separate course in itself, uh, but I am going to introduce uh, some concepts in each class as and when required and is relevant for our discussion on economics of health and education. In the second part of today's lesson, we will learn the key concepts in Grossman's model of demand for health care. Here we will distinguish between health and health care and we will also look at the important concepts that Grossman's model uh, centered in the discussion of uh, healthcare economics or health economics and then finally we will summarize our discussion based upon the three roles of health in Grossman's model. So, let us straight away begin with this concept of uh, demand function. Um, consumer demand theory postulates that quantity demanded of a commodity is a function of various factors. Uh, so, when we talk about the demand for a commodity, let us say X, uh, we see that there is a functional relationship of quantity demanded with the price of that commodity, the consumer's income, the price of related goods or commodities and the taste of the consumer. So, we often write it in the form of a functional form such as this, where uh, quantity demanded of X is a function of price of the commodity X, income of the consumer price of related goods and services and T referring to the taste of the consumer. And the quantity demanded of uh, the commodity X by an individual could be across various time periods. We could scale it up for a year, we could look at quantity demanded in a month or a week or a day and so on and so forth. So, depending upon the model in question, we can look at quantity demanded of commodity at any uh, period of time. Now, generally, Keeping all of these other things constant, income, prices of related goods and taste of the consumer constant, we uh, theorize that there is an inverse relationship between price of the commodity and quantity demanded of the commodity. Meaning that when the price of a commodity rises, quantity demanded of the commodity uh, goes down and vice versa. So, generally there is an inverse functional relationship between quantity demanded and price of the commodity. Now, when we say that there is an inverse relationship between quantity demanded and price, we must understand that this is not generally applicable to all goods and services. So, economists make a distinction between different kinds of goods. Most commonly, we distinguish between normal goods and inferior goods. Now, definitionally, what are normal goods? Normal goods are those goods uh, which a consumer has a preference for more and more when his or her incomes rises. So, this basically refers to all goods and services that we generally prefer 
or we want to have more of under normal circumstances. So when a consumer's income rises, she purchases more of most such commodities, for example, uh, shoes, bags, it could be going to watch a movie, travel, demanding more education, technical education, skilled education, buying automobiles, housing, etc. Now compared to normal goods, we also have inferior goods for which consumers do not have much of a preference book for. So when a consumer's income rises, she purchases less of these commodities, example unbranded clothes and shoes, coarse grains and so on and so forth. So in economics, when we are understanding exchange of goods and services or when we are explaining demand and supply with respect to behavior of consumers and firms, we are generally referring to normal goods and services. Uh, which uh, so a rational consumer always has a preference for more of normal goods and services and this inverse price demand relationship that we just discussed is applicable to mostly normal goods and services. We may not see an inverse uh, relationship between quantity demanded and price in the case of inferior goods. Often we also bring into the discussion luxury goods or goods that that is selectively preferred by very high income sections of population. Even there we may not see inverse price demand relationship. So when we are talking about inverse price demand relationship in economics, we are talking about a rational consumer uh, who has a preference for more and more of normal goods. Now we must also distinguish between uh, durable and perishable goods and the concept of durable good has uh, significant importance in the context of uh, demand for health and education. So normal goods and inferior goods may be durable or perishable which is dependent upon the shelf life of the good. So these types of goods are determined by the shelf life of the normal or the inferior good in question and durable uh, uh, goods are mostly those which have a longer shelf life and perishable goods as the name suggests does not have a longer shelf life. Now given that there is an inverse uh, quantity and price relationship, this is generally how a demand curve uh, looks like. You have a downward sloping uh, demand curve, it could be a linear demand curve or a non-linear one. But it is useful to examine this relationship between quantity demanded of a commodity per unit of time and the price of commodity only. And here we assume that all other things are remaining constant which means that the consumer's incomes are not rising, the tastes are not changing, prices of related goods and commodities have not changed. So given that all of these other things remain constant, we see this inverse relationship. And this is an imaginary table that I have taken which to show this uh, relationship. Now given that this relationship we see that you know that the slope of the demand curve is it is a negatively sloping demand curve. This is guided by the uh, idea of uh, diminishing marginal utility and this concept of diminishing marginal uh, utility uh, will frequently occur in any discussion of uh, uh, of microeconomics and most of the downward sloping demand curves or when we come to indifference curves we will realize that a rational consumer who is always preferring more of one goods uh, to the other or a rational consumer who uh, follows the relationship of, uh, of demanding less and less of a commodity when the price of the commodity rises is guided by the law of diminishing marginal utility which means that as the consumer keeps consuming more of a commodity, the additional utility that she derives out of the same commodity keeps on declining. Now, another concept that is important for our discussion on uh, uh, health economics and which also lays the foundation uh, which takes from derives from microeconomics is substitution effect and income effect. Now the fact that there is an inverse relationship between price and quantity uh, basically tells us that this is due to substitution effect which means that when the price of a commodity rises the consumer is substituting less and less of that commodity and probably preferring more of the other commodity whose price has not risen. And similarly, when the price of a commodity falls, the quantity demanded by the consumer increases because the consumer substitutes more of the present commodity in reference to some other commodity which she was consuming. So it is a relative calculation that the consumer is doing with regard to the commodity that she is consuming. So in this sense, it is referred to as a substitution effect. 
If I take you back to the uh, diagram of the negatively sloped demand curve that we were just seeing here, you would see that on the y axis we have price, on the x axis we have quantity demanded. Now here you would see that uh, this shows us the difference in price uh, of the commodity and this shows us the quantity demanded of the commodity. You would see that as the price of the uh, quantity of the uh, commodity declines, the uh, consumer wants to demand uh, more of the commodity. But this also shows us how much the consumer is substituting of the commodity when the price is declining. So, the substitution effect is calculated or estimated based upon uh, the relative price of other goods and services that the consumer is consuming or whether the price of the commodity that the consumer is consuming is increasing or decreasing. So, this is what is referred to as substitution effect. Now, along with substitution effect, there is another effect that also comes into being when there is a price fluctuation and this is referred to as an income effect. So, suppose the price of a commodity falls, uh, that effectively means that the disposable income that is with the consumer rises and this is what is referred to as the real income effect or the income effect. So, which means that the real income of the consumer increases because of the fall of the price of a normal good which the consumer was otherwise consuming. So, when there are price fluctuations, it immediately impacts the disposable income of the consumer which is referred to as the income effect. So, when price falls, real income rises, so you have a positive income effect. When price rises, real income uh, falls and you have a negative income effect. So, whenever there is a price change and that impacts the quantity demanded by the consumer, uh, that these are the two effects that immediately come into play, the substitution effect and the income effect and depending upon which effect overwhelms the uh, other effect, uh, it has an impact on the amount demanded of the commodity by the consumer. Um, now, along with substitution effect and income effect, uh, another important distinction that needs to be made is between real income and nominal income. I have just mentioned that when there is an uh, income effect comes into being because of a change in real income of the consumer due to a fall in the price of uh, the commodity X or it could be a rise in the price of commodity X in which case the income, real income might uh, come uh, down. Now, it is important to distinguish between real income and nominal income because in economics we discuss about the uh, real income of the consumer and not just the nominal income. Nominal income here basically refers to the actual money income and is, it is in current prices, but real income uh, can be calculated based upon the price effect uh, which includes the income effect and the substitution effect or it could be because of the change in the general level of price in the economy or in other words the inflationary uh, conditions within the economy. So, suppose there is a general rise in the level of prices in the economy, it might also affect the real income of the consumer. So, the real income has to be calculated by indexing the prices to inflation within the economy and there are various measures of uh, how these indexations are carried out. Uh, there are various price indices that are calculated based upon which uh, such uh, real income calculations uh, take place. Uh, however, we do not need to uh, focus our attention there for the time being. What is uh, important for us to know is that there is a distinction that is to be made between real income and nominal income and also that uh, given that there is this uh, price demand uh, quantity demand relationship, uh, the price and quantity demanded relationship also includes uh, the impact of price effect on quantity demanded by the consumer of the commodity and the price effect includes the substitution effect and the income effect. The substitution effect can be understood when we are looking at how much more of a commodity we are consuming because of the price fall or how much less of a commodity we are consuming because of a price rise. That is in other words saying that we are substituting more or less of a commodity because of the price rise or fall. Similarly, uh, it could be because of the uh, price uh, fluctuation of the commodity that we are consuming and then we are comparing it relative to the prices of other goods and services. If we want to substitute um, the commodity that we are consuming uh, with the commodity 
uh, whose prices may not have changed, then also we can calculate substitution effect and the income effect. Now, along with uh, the demand function, the slope of the demand curve and the substitution effect and income effect, uh, a very important concept that is central to all discussions on demand and supply is price elasticity of demand. Now, simply put price elasticity of demand basically refers to the sensitivity of uh, the uh, demand when the price of the commodity changes. If we have to come up with a definition of it, we can define it by saying that price elasticity of demand is the responsiveness in quantity demanded of a commodity to the change in its price. Now, why this is an important concept? Because uh, price elasticity of demand impacts not just consumer demand, but it also impacts the revenue of the firms or it impacts the supply of goods and services in the uh, in the market that we are discussing about. Because uh, price, if consumers are sensitive to price changes, which price elasticity as a concept captures, then that will immediately impact their demand for commodities in the market. And if demand gets affected or impacted, then it will impact the uh, supply of commodities in the market and then uh, ultimately impacting the production or sales of the firms and eventually impacting profitability. So, price elasticity of demand is central to most discussions surrounding demand and supply of goods and services, whether it is physical goods and services uh, or normal goods and services as we generally encounter or whether it is demand for education and health and uh, various such kinds of services which have enormous market failures. Now, there are various measures of price elasticity of demand. Uh, there is point price elasticity, arc price elasticity of demand, cross price elasticity of demand, there is income elasticity of demand and so on. Uh, to be able to understand this concept, we can just take reference of the point price elasticity of demand. So, this one is given by the uh, percentage change in uh, quantity demanded to the percentage change in the price and uh, this uh, is referred to as the point price elasticity of demand as it basically measures elasticity at a point on the demand curve. And uh, like we have seen in the case of an inverse sloping demand curve in the previous slide, price is plotted on the vertical axis, quantity demanded is plotted on the horizontal axis and the quantity response to a change in price is measured by the change in quantity to the change in price, which is basically the inverse of the slope of the demand curve which we had seen. So, if I can take you back to this here. So, in case of price elasticity of demand, we are basically referring to the change in quantity to the change in price. And this is also calculated on the point of the uh, demand curve, which is referred to as the point elasticity of uh, demand curve. Now, in terms of calculus, we take the partial derivative to be able to come up with the elasticity of demand. Um, and uh, similarly, we can also calculate cross price elasticity of demand, where instead of just looking at the price, uh, the quantity demanded of the commodity that we are consuming, we also look at the quantity demanded of X and Y. Similarly, we also look at the price of X and Y and that will give us what is the responsiveness of change in the quantity demanded of a commodity because the price of another commodity has changed. And uh, these are, as I mentioned, important considerations in microeconomics and also has a bearing on the economics of health and education when we are considering health and education markets. Now, uh, let us uh, come to another important uh, uh, concept of microeconomics, which is uh, the consumer choice uh, theory, all of what we are discussing so far are a part of uh, consumer choice theory. And as I mentioned in the beginning of this lecture that consumer choice or consumer behavior uh, can be a separate course in itself. However, it is useful to borrow some concepts from the consumer choice theory to be able to make sense of the Grossman's model. Now, here I would like to draw your attention to this uh, graph here. 
Uh, now, this is a two dimensional graph where you have two goods, good A and good B. Good A is on the y axis, B is on the x axis. Now, often in economics, we may refer to two separate goods or when we are discussing consumer choice theory, we may refer to two separate consumption bundles. So, you can easily consider this not just as one good, but a consumption bundle. Uh, it can also be referred to as a consumption bundle. Bundle meaning that it is not just one good, but it can contain a vector of a lot of other goods. And uh, you will in the later slides see why this uh, conceptualization of a consumption bundle is important, particularly when we are discussing demand for uh, health and education and so on. Similarly, we can look at B as a consumption bundle. So, what we see here are there are two important parameters here. First, we have an indifference curve, the red curves that you see are the indifference curves. Now, what are these indifference curves? These indifference curves are basically telling us, showing us the consumer's preferences for consumption bundle A and consumption bundle B. Now, all these points on the indifference curves basically tells us that given all other conditions remaining the same, the consumer is indifferent between all the consumption bundles on the indifference curves. So, for example, if the consumer is here, she may prefer these many consumption bundle A and the consumer may prefer these many bundles of consumption bundle B. Now, similarly, if the consumer is on the point D here, she may prefer these many consumption bundles of A and she may prefer these many consumption bundles of B. Uh, but the point here is that as far as the indifference curve is concerned, this indifference curve will give the same level of utility to the consumer irrespective of whether she is at this point or she is at this point. So, this is a basic uh, introduction to consumer choice theory where we are saying that a rational consumer who is uh, trading normal goods in the market or who is demanding normal goods in the market is always making a choice between different kinds of consumption bundles and that can be depicted in the form of a two dimensional graph where we show the indifference curve here and the consumer is indifferent between any of these consumption bundles. But of course, there is a trade off. If the consumer is preferring more of A, then she is preferring less of B and so on and so forth. And uh, this trade off is important because there is a constraint. We will come to the constraint is some time, but let me tell a few more things about the indifference curve here. So, as I have just mentioned that this is an indifference curve, this provides us uh, an information about the utility derived by the consumer because she is consuming different consumption bundles. But the important point is that the consumer is indifferent between each of the bundles that she is consuming on the indifference curve and there is always a trade off. If she is consuming more of A, she has to consume less of B, she has to give up less of uh, B and so on. Now, the other point is that generally a rational consumer always wants to be on the higher indifference curve. So, when we have more indifference curves on a two dimensional graph like this, we are basically referring to this as an indifference map, which is basically a collection of indifference curves. So, a consumer, a rational consumer who has a preference for normal goods and who has a preference for more and more goods as her income rises would like to be on the higher indifference curves and she would like to keep moving from one indifference curve to the other. And why? Because a higher indifference curves provides her more utility than the lower indifference curve. So, these are all, uh, so if we number them as u1, u2 and u3, as the consumer moves from u1 to u2 to u3, we know that you know that uh, the u2 gives her more utility than the indifference curve u1. Now, the point is although the consumer might want to move to higher and higher indifference curve, there is a constraint and that constraint is in the form of this straight line here, which has a y intercept and an x intercept here. This is basically referred to as the budget constraint. This tells us that there is a constraint, although the consumer has the preference to move to higher and higher indifference curves, it may not be possible for the consumer to move to let us say u3 because she has a budget constraint which is tangent to a point on the indifference curve u2, which means that she is able to afford only 
up till this bundle c here she can afford this uh, she may not be able to afford this because this is above her budget line uh, similarly she can afford these points but she cannot afford a point a and e because she has a budget constraint here which constrains her affordability of different consumption bundles so through this what we have seen is that it is we have been able to depict uh, consumer choice with the help of indifference curves and a budget constraint now because uh, it, it is not very hard to imagine that there are different uh, kinds of consumers and there are different uh, income levels of the consumers so we can have a budget line which also changes so for example uh, if when the budget line when a becomes more expensive the consumer is able to afford less of a and therefore you have a budget line which has shifted the y intercept has uh, shifted so you can have different budget constraints given the price that the consumer faces in the market given the income that the consumer faces in the market so the budget line is usually uh, given by uh, here this is the equation of the budget line where m refers to income uh, price of x and qx basically refers to the price of commodity x and the quantity demanded of x price of commodity y and quantity demanded of y m is equal to px qx plus py QY. So, this is the uh, budget constraint here and uh, so we have two important parameters here. We have a utility function which is given by the indifference curve and we have a budget constraint which is given by this straight line here. So, the consumer now is faced with uh, preferences. She has preferences for consuming more and more goods but she has a budget constraint. So, what does she do under these circumstances? So, consumer and we assume here that a consumer spends all of his or her income on commodities uh, x and y and I have already mentioned these can be commodities or these can be consumption bundles. So, let us say the consumer spends all of her income on the consumption bundles x and y. To reach a point of equilibrium, the consumer must maximize her utility subject to the budget constraint. In economics, we follow uh, optimization methods. So, the this is the utility function of the consumer here and this is the uh, budget line here. So, to be able to uh, optimize uh, the commodities that she has preference for, the consumer has to maximize her utility function subject to the budget constraint here and for this we use a Lagrangian function to calculate constraint maximization problem which is given by this equation here. But diagrammatically, if we have to show if the consumer is following utility maximization, the point where the slope of the indifference curve is uh, just tangent to the budget line is the point of equilibrium. This is basically the optimizing the, the optimum uh, bundle that the consumer will be satisfied with given the budget constraint that she has. So, there are three conditions for consumer's equilibrium here which is important for the learners to understand. One is that the budget line must be tangent to the indifference curve as you can see here. This consumer here is preferring X pizzas and shakes let us say and uh, these are as you can see uh, different utilities of the on the indifference curve. This one gives lowest utility, this has the highest utility and uh, the uh, indifference curve which gives her 100 utils or 100 points of utility uh, is uh, the indifference curve that she is on but the point A is the consumer's most preferred point because this is where she optimizes her uh, preferences given the budget constraint that she has. So, the first is that the budget line has to be tangent to the indifference curve. The second is that at this point of equilibrium the slope of the indifference curve and the budget line are just the same and the third is that the indifference curves must be convex uh, to the origin. Now, this convexity assumption of the indifference curve is an important assumption uh, in uh, consumer choice theory and this also reflects the diminishing marginal utility or the diminishing marginal rate of substitution guided by diminishing marginal utility assumption in consumer choice theory. Now, diminishing marginal rate of substitution basically means that as the consumer moves from one point to the uh, next on the indifference curve, she is always willing to 
substitute fewer commodities for more of the other and this is guided by the assumption of diminishing marginal utility because as the consumer increases her consumption of different bundles or different goods, the additional utility that she derives out of those commodities keeps on declining. And this is the general assumption based upon which the neoclassical uh, consumer choice theory is uh, based upon and this is what we consider is uh, central to uh, some of the theorization surrounding uh, market demand or uh, demand for various goods and commodities and this also has uh, some uh, interconnections with the demand for health and education that we are discussing. So, I end the first part of the uh, lesson here. Uh, what we did in the first part is to get introduced to the idea of a demand function. Uh, we also got introduced to the uh, relationship between quantity demanded and price. Uh, I have used the terms rational consumer, I have used the term normal goods and I have said that the consumer generally has a preference for normal goods, a rational consumer is uh, preferring normal goods in the market and the other things remaining constant, there is an inverse relationship between quantity demanded and price of the commodity. Uh, we have also uh, looked into the concepts of substitution effect and income effect. We have seen that whenever there is a price change and uh, the concurrent demand uh, change or quantity demanded uh, uh, changes, we see that there is a price effect coming into being and this price effect constitutes substitution effect and income effect. This basically says that whenever there is a price change, the consumer is always substituting one good for the other or more of one good for um, less of the other or vice versa depending upon the direction in which the price changes. We also saw that when there is a price change, there is a concomitant change in the income of the consumer and here we are referring to real income of the consumer not just nominal income. Nominal income of course may remain the same, but whenever there is a price fluctuation or a price change in any direction, the disposable income of the consumer changes because of the price change and that may also impact the quantity demanded of the concerned commodity or related commodities. We also distinguished between uh, the concept of real income and nominal income where we said that uh, apart from uh, calculation of real income due to price changes, we can also uh, take into consideration inflationary changes, uh, inflation levels within the economy and index uh, price changes uh, uh, to uh, the uh, price indices and calculate real incomes. Uh, finally, we also discussed uh, the uh, concept of indifference map and indifference curves. We saw that a rational consumer when she is demanding normal goods within the economy, uh, she is faced with an indifference map which basically shows what are the preferences for the goods that she, is, she wants to uh, choose in the market. We discussed the concept of budget line and we discussed the concept of equilibrium which is the point of tangency of the indifference curve and the budget line. Now, with the, just these concepts, we can try to understand the Grossman's model of demand for health uh, and health care now. Let us go to the move to the second part of the lesson now. Now, before I can go to the Grossman's uh, model of demand for health, we must make a distinction between demand for health and health care. Now, we cannot use health and health care synonymously, uh, but they are interrelated and that distinction must be understood. Uh, in health economics, demand for health and demand for health care are distinct but interconnected ideas and understanding and distinguishing between these demands is crucial for designing effective health policies and interventions. So, what is demand for health? Demand for health basically refers to health status of a person or an individual. It refers to the individual's desire to achieve and maintain good health. And this is not a demand for specific services or products, but rather it is an intrinsic preference or inherent preference for well-being and a life free from illnesses. When estimating demand functions, we often talk about uh, health uh, status. This is another way of uh, understanding demand for health. So, what is the health status? What is the well-being status of an individual or a group of individuals is what is referred to as demand for health. Demand for health care and sometimes we also use the term uh, medical care uh, refers to the demand for medical services, treatments and interventions that help maintain or restore health and this can include everything from doctor visits to hospital stays to pharmaceuticals and surgeries. So, now you see that there is an inherent difference between demand for health and health care. 
um, now the relationship between these two demands is not always straightforward people may demand we may want to have better health status and uh, therefore to be able to improve our health status we may demand more health care uh, as a means to improve or maintain their health so an increase in demand for health could lead to increased demand for health care services but not all demand for health care is directly linked to improving health outcomes for example cosmetic sur surgery may be uh, desired by a lot of consumers but it may not improve health but it can still be in demand so the relationship between these two demands is not straightforward often in the context of demand for health models we use the term demand for health more instead of demand for health care considering that demand for health care is primitive in the model on demand for health or is already captured in the demand for health we will uh, discuss some of these points now now as I mentioned, Grossman 1972 monograph, The Demand for Health, a theoretical and empirical investigation was a groundbreaking work. There have been many revisions to this work uh, over a period of time by Grossman himself. Many other economists have also made uh, revisions and contributions and extensions to this model. Uh, in this lesson, however, we are discussing the basic Grossman model uh, because it is important that we become familiar with some of the uh, terms that this model brought into the domain of health economics. The first is health as a durable capital stock. In Grossman's model, health is a durable capital stock which produces an output of healthy time. And uh, Grossman's model assumes that all individuals are born with a certain amount of health capital that depreciates with time or that depreciates with age. And individuals can invest in their health capital through medical care, through diet, exercise and other health preserving activities which can slow down the depreciation rate or the, or the um, uh, depreciation rate meaning slow down the health deterioration process and in the process increase the stock of health capital. So in uh, Grossman's model introduces health or the state of well-being as a durable capital stock and uh, notice the term durable capital stock here because in the context of human beings we are talking about a life cycle hypothesis or a lifespan we are talking about a longer period of time so in that sense the shelf life of uh, health uh, as a capital uh, durable capital stock may be long uh, or short uh, depending upon various uh, factors so the very first conceptualization in Grossman's model is that health is a durable capital stock that produces an output of healthy time and um, it is important that uh, the term uh, health is being uh, used as a as capital here in uh, the in week one we discussed about the human capital theory and the importance it has uh, for some of the theorizations of um, uh, related to health and education uh, you would see here that health capital here necessarily is connected to the idea of increased productivity at a later period of time. So in that sense health is a durable capital stock that produces an output of healthy time. Now since Grossman has conceptualized um, health as a durable capital stock, he is also in his model referring to health as an investment good as well as a consumption good meaning that good health can be utilized as an input indicator to be able to obtain the output of uh, long healthy time or um, different kinds of investments can lead to good health over a period of time. So in that sense um, Grossman's model uses uh, health as both an investment good and a consumption good. As an investment good we can theorize a production function for health and as a consumption good we can theorize a utility function for health. So based upon Grossman's model health can be uh, an outcome or an output as well as an input for uh, better health in a future point of time. So in that sense health is uh, an investment as well as a consumption good in the consumption in Grossman's demand model. Uh, in the demand for health model. So we can have a production function for health as well as a utility function for health. Let us now look at the Grossman's health production function. So based on Grossman's model we can uh, mathematically represent a health production function which reads uh, like this. So on the left hand side you have uh, H 
T plus uh, 1 which basically refers to the stock of health at a future point of time. So, at, at T plus 1 time period what the stock of health is dependent upon the stock of health HT in the current time period plus the investments that we make to improve upon the health stock which could include medical care MT, it could also include various lifestyle choices and other health inputs such as diet and exercise ET. So, health at time period T plus 1, the health stock, stock of durable uh, capital stock of health at a uh, later point of time or T plus 1 is dependent upon the current stock of health plus the investments that we make on the current stock of health. But uh, Grossman also introduces the concept of depreciation here. So, here delta refers to depreciation rate of health which is again dependent upon the stock of health as well as the age of the uh, consumer or the individual concerned in time period T. So, this is uh, the production of health um, at in time T plus 1 which is dependent upon the stock of health in time T plus investments made on uh, health in time T due to uh, medical care or other uh, inputs uh, reflecting lifestyle choices and so on and also taking into account the amount of loss in the durable capital stock or depreciation because of the kind of stock of health that we have along with age being an important factor which contributes to the depreciation of the stock of capital. So, Grossman's model introduces a production function for health. Now, the model also uh, talks about an utility function for health. Uh, so, the same household which is spending on health care uh, produces health at the household level, but the same household can also have a utility function for health. So, in Grossman's model the utility function is often uh, represented as a function of uh, CT and uh, health HT in each time period T. So, this is the utility function uh, which is shown as a combination of uh, CT and uh, HT. CT here refers to consumption of all other goods and services. I have mentioned non-health goods here. Um, there is a chance that learners may read it uh, differently. Uh, however, I would like to make a correction that these do not refer to uh, goods that are health deteriorating in nature. It is do not, let me write it here, this do not refer to goods that are health deteriorating in nature. These basically refer to all other goods and services that the consumer may have a preference for along with HT or the health of the consumer. So, CT here refers to consumption of all other goods and services during the time period T and HT represents a stock of health that the consumer has and also the as we have seen in the uh, last slide here that there are investments being made to the stock of health that the individual has. So, here the utility function refers to CT and HT along with the expenses that the uh, consumer is making on H to be able to continue having the durable stock of capital. There are two parameters here alpha and beta. This basically follows a Cobb Douglas production function. Now, alpha and beta parameters basically reflect the relative weights of uh, CT and HT in this utility function. So, if the consumer puts more weight on consumption of other goods and services, uh, this has uh, more value in the utility function or the consumer has more of these goods in the utility function and uh, vice versa. Now, note here that health care or medical care does not appear explicitly in this utility function and I have used the term that health care or medical care is primitive in this function which means that it is captured in this utility function through the stock of uh, the durable stock of health that the individual has. Now, I just mentioned that this utility function uh, is a Cobb-Douglas type function. So, this is a common form used in the economic models of health. 
Uh, now, the alpha and beta parameters indicate how consumption of other goods and health contribute to overall utility of an individual. So, a higher alpha means that the individual places more value on consumption of other goods while a higher beta indicates a greater value placed on health. And these parameters essentially show the trade-offs an individual is willing to make between consumption of health and other goods. So, um, if you can recall the indifference curve diagram that uh, we just discussed which was talking about the trade-offs between two consumption bundles here. You can actually think of HT and CT as two separate consumption bundles and there is a trade-off that the a choice has to be made by the consumer because there is a trade-off between these uh, consumption bundles and why there is to be a trade-off because there is a budget constraint and the budget constraint basically guides the consumer. Um, into uh, making a choice between uh, more or less of CT and HT and so on. Now, this Cobb Douglas utility function also has two essential properties which is uh, very similar to the property that we have been discussing so far when the consumer, rational consumer is making a choice in the market. One is it is guided by the diminishing marginal utility. So, the CD utility function assumes diminishing marginal utility in both consumption of health and other goods which basically means that additional units of consumption of CT and HT will always provide uh, less additional utility as the amount of each increases. Um, now, this is a standard assumption that is made in most of uh, microeconomic understanding of consumer choice theory. The parameters alpha and beta here in the uh, CD function uh, basically refer to constant elasticity of substitution. This specific form of the CD utility function implies that the rate of substitution between health and other forms of consumption remains constant. Now, again to be able to explain this better, I would like to go back to the uh, indifference curve here where I was saying that this bundle, let us say this bundle B is uh, HT and this uh, bundle A is HT and let us say this bundle B is uh, CT, then what we are saying here is that the consumer is substituting bundle A for B and vice versa depending upon which position on the indifference curve the consumer is. So, there is a constant elasticity of substitution. The consumer is indifferent between substituting one bundle uh, with the other and this is what is referred to as constant elasticity of substitution here. This specific form of the CD utility function implies that the rate of substitution between health and other forms of consumption remains constant. So, we can also say that the elasticity of substitution between CT and HT is equal to 1 which means that the rate at which an individual is willing to trade off health for other goods does not change as the quantities consumed of health and other goods uh, change. Now, this is uh, how uh, if we plot health and consumption or we can also uh, refer to this as H uh, T here and this as C T here. So, if we plot this on the indifference curve, it would look like something like this. So, here we are providing an interpretation for uh, health here. So, how do we interpret this variable H? I have made this distinction between health status and health care or medical care. Uh, generally, we know if we are feeling healthy and when we are not and often the complications is with regard to quantifying the uh, this variable uh, H here, which is why we look at um, expenditures made on health care because the status of health of an individual is a subjective perception. Uh, a person can only tell whether he or she is feeling well or not. Uh, it could be an yes no question, but often we run into problems of quantification when we are discussing health status and this is where um, expenditure on health care becomes useful, uh, becomes an useful indicator for uh, discussing the health status of an individual, which is why we have mentioned that if we are demanding more of health, we are demanding more of medical expenditure. Uh, or health expenditure so as to maintain that durable capital stock of health uh, in a given period of time or a point of time. Uh, so, there are exceptions to this rule as well as the course progresses, I will see if I can bring those concepts into, but what is important for us to understand here is that we are interpreting this variable health in terms of the expenditure that we are making on medical care uh, services and it can be shown in the form of an indifference curve. Uh, as depicted on the slide here. Now, 
Grossman's model has also expanded this utility function or extended this utility function. What we have seen so far in this utility function here is uh, basically a static utility function. This is talking about an utility function in a given point of time t in a single time period. But uh, as we all know that uh, the it is a durable capital stock, there is a, um, the individuals live for a longer period of time. So, which means it is a dynamic process. So, when we are talking about the preference of an individual for health HT and CT, it uh, the preference uh, continues for over a period of time. So, health models generally follow a life cycle approach meaning that the production of health changes over a person's lifetime and to be able to capture that Grossman introduces utility function in an intertemporal context or bringing in time where the utility at each period is discounted back to the uh, present value. For this we have an extended utility function. Now, if you look at this, this is this here gives a combination of all other consumption and uh, health as we have seen over the time period uh, starting from T0 to T. So, so, it could be it is a fairly long period of time. So, this uh, term here refers to the combination of all goods or consumption bundles that the consumer consumes. Uh, this term here refers to the risk aversion of the individual. So, the uh, 1 minus gamma here basically tells us what is the curvature of the utility function. If the individual is more risk averse or less risk averse that will determine the shape of the utility function or the curvature of the utility function. So, gamma here is a parameter that represents the risk aversion of the individual. Uh, we have also the Grossman also introduces uh, the um, parameter r here which represents the discount uh, rate or how future utility is valued relative to present utility. The expected utility in a future uh, period uh, has to be taken into consideration when we look at uh, demand for uh, different consumption bundles uh, over a period of time. And uh, big T here is the time horizon reflecting the lifespan over which the utility is calculated. So, uh, Grossman comes up with an extended utility function not just a static utility function as in the case of a single time period T that we saw. Here Grossman also takes into consideration the expected utility that the consumer may have uh, for the different consumption bundles that she is consuming in a given um, over a period of time. So, whether she, whether she expects more utility from CT or she expects more utility from health. If a consumer values more health in the future or a consumer values more of other consumption goods and services in the future will also uh, impact the utility function of the consumer. Similarly, whether a consumer is a risk averse person or is a risk taker will also um, uh, impact the uh, utility function of the consumer. So, uh, this is what is referred to as the uh, extended utility function where the consumer's uh, behavior uh, with regard to uh, his or her preference for different kinds of goods and the expected utility that she uh, is uh, deriving out of these goods also enters into the utility function. So, uh, just to give a more clarity to the extended utility function specification of Grossman, it helps us to understand how individuals make decisions about consuming or investing in health goods and other goods under the budget constraints. So, it helps us to explain health investments. So, if a person is uh, less risk averse let us say and uh, expects more utility out of health goods in the future, then the person may want to spend more on health or increase health investments. So, how much individuals are willing to invest in health to maintain or increase their health capital. Similarly, if a person is a risk taker and uh, does not expect more utility out of uh, health consumption of health goods, then the person may not be willing to spend on uh, health or health investments will be low for that individual. Similar kinds of analysis can also be extended at the country level, but that is not the scope of our uh, learning currently. Second is consumption choices, how individuals allocate their income between healthcare and other goods also can be explained. Uh, through this extended utility function and this also has policy effects, how changes in policy like healthcare subsidies or taxes on unhealthy goods can alter individual behaviors regarding health and consumption. 
So, Grossman's extended health utility function also helps us to analyze a wide range of health economic issues including the impacts of aging, medical interventions and the effects of public policy on health behavior of individuals. Let me now conclude uh, Grossman's uh, model by highlighting three roles of health uh, that uh, Grossman uh, ascribes to in his uh, model of demand for health. First is that he looks at health as a consumption good because it contributes directly to the individual's utility function in each period because being health is valuable in and of itself. It has intrinsic importance and this is something that I have discussed in detail in the last few lessons uh, that there is an intrinsic importance of health that makes health a consumption good. So, if one has to ask uh, what do we mean when we say that health is a consumption good? It basically means that it has intrinsic importance or it enters into the production function as an input uh, variable. Health is an input into production, it generates productive time which is useful for producing more H and S. So, health is a consumption good, health is an input into production and finally, health is a form of capital. Unlike uh, C, health endures from period to period, it can accumulate or depreciate over time. So, other goods and services may uh, increase over a period of time, but uh, health may, uh, we can accumulate health uh, over a period of time, but because we are aging, uh, the depreciation sets in as far as uh, H is concerned. So, improvements in health today can lead to better health tomorrow. So, in the second part of this lesson, we discuss the Grossman's model of demand for health. We introduce some important concepts. One is we looked at health as a durable stock of capital. We discussed the production function of health where we saw that if uh, health uh, in time t plus 1 is dependent upon the stock of health in time t plus the investments made on the stock of health. Um, uh, minus the depreciation that sets in because of uh, the uh, aging that uh, takes place. Uh, we also saw that the utility function of health uh, includes uh, a combination of both uh, C which is consumption of all other goods and H and it can be theorized in a single time period T uh, which means that the utility derived by the consumer because of the combination of both of these goods. And uh, we, we saw that this usually follows a Cobb Douglas type function where the parameters alpha and beta are substitutable. Uh, so, depending upon the relative weight given to C and H, uh, the utility derived by the combination of goods and services is determined. Uh, we also uh, saw that the uh, choice of the consumer between the consumption bundle C and H can be depicted in the form of indifference maps or indifference curve. And uh, there is a problem of quantifying uh, health uh, per se, but uh, the task becomes easier if uh, health care or expenditure on health care and medical care is primitive to this uh, equation or this graph. So, which means that when we are demanding more of health, we are basically demanding more of health care expenditure. We also saw that uh, Grossman talks about an extended utility function by bringing uh, in the a life cycle approach to understanding utility function because health deteriorates over a period of time, depreciation sets in. So, when we are looking at utility function, we cannot look at utility function of C and uh, of, of the consumer only in time t, we have to look at uh, the entire time period of the person's uh, lifetime. So, this is again the utility is a combination of uh, C and H. Uh, depending upon the risk averseness of the individual or the risk taking behavior of the individual and it also depends upon the discounted rate of the uh, value that we are putting on uh, health goods and other goods over a period of time or in other words what is the expected utility out of the goods that we are demanding over a period of time. And then finally, we saw that uh, in the same model uh, Grossman talks about uh, three fu functions of health or roles of health. He is talking about health as a consumption good and an investment good and he highlights uh, three important points. Health is a consumption good which contributes directly to the individual's utility function. Health is an input in a production and health is also an output or a form of capital which is a durable capital stock uh, and um, which accumulates or depreciates over a period of time. These are the uh, references that I have extensively used for today's lectures. 
uh, William Jack Principles of Health Economics for Developing Countries. This is a highly uh, recommended book for students who are interested to dwell deeper into the microeconomics of health. Uh, similarly, J. Bhattacharya, Timothy Hyde and Peter Tu, the Palgrave Macmillan Health Economics, uh, a very important reference for uh, students who want to get introduced to microeconomics of health. I have uh, utilized uh, Michael Grossman Demand for Health uh, paper uh, published in 2017 based on his 1972 monograph. There are many uh, um, revisions to this paper, there are many extensions to this paper and the interested learner can find various versions of this paper in different forums and portals which will give you a good understanding and grasp over the Grossman model of demand for health. So, with this I end uh, the uh, week 2 of the uh, course on economics of health and education. In the next week we will discuss about the uh, some of the implications of this demand model, but we will also look at uh, demand for education and education markets. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm.